Hello, Internet. Welcome to episode 66 of the Stanford MLSA seminar series. Uh, my name is Dan. Today I have with me Piero. Hello. Fyodor. Hey. And our guest, Roman Katsinik. Um, so a little bit about, uh, so as usual today, we'll have about a half hour talk followed by a half hour um, podcast style discussion where you, the live audience, can ask questions. So just feel free to stick those into the YouTube chat at any time. Um, uh, and a little bit about Roman. So he's a he's working at Meta on the AI platform team. Today he's going to be talking to us a little bit about machine learning and production and a review of some empirical solutions. So um, we're definitely looking very forward to that. Uh, looking uh, forward to that. So Roman, go ahead, uh, start sharing your screen and take it away. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Dan. Yes, so my name is Roman Kazinik. I am with Meta. I'm working in AI org on AI platform. I, and today I'm going to speak about the empirical solutions, the lack of analytical guidance, and the potential and apparent disconnect between the two. Uh, actually, for today, I decided to bring for us really hard problems. I I'm, I'm speaking about problems that essentially have, uh, in, have no human consensus. Like most of the problems that we, in AI, or a lot of problems in AI that we are working with will strongly rely on so-called human bias. We can look at images and, and we with uh, 90 or maybe 99% agreement can decide on where we can see a dog or a cat in the image. There is a wide range of problems where this human consensus simply, simply does not exist. Today, also, I'm going to speak about problems that don't have any expert knowledge. We have uh, an AI, uh, when we look at problems such as uh, identifying de uh, defects of manufacturing, we will have experts that will agree between themselves, and then we'll be able to train a model that will produce the expert knowledge. There's a wide range of problems in machine learning and production machine learning that simply do not have such expert knowledge. Specifically, I'm speaking about ads recommendation and content recommendation. And sometimes it's also called, called ranking algorithms or ranking ML, ranking problems. I will give you an example. At Meta, we have billions of users and we have millions of content and ads that we need to recommend, that we recommend every second and every time and in every location to, this, to the users. It's hard to think that there is any expert that can tell which ad needs to be recommended at each time and at each location to each user with high accuracy. So before my, my next plan, my plan is actually not now is to explain us the achievements or successes that we have made in the past years. I should, I think I will start with my personal experience. The first time I trained in model on a cluster, it was over 13 years ago. We did not have TensorFlow. We did not have gradient. Uh, updates we created we actually computed and derived the gradients and we put them on a cluster i worked in the field of oil exploration there are i think there are multiple areas where big data existed even in the pre big data era in oil exploration working with terabytes of data and training models on clusters it's something that people did over 20 years ago but there's a big difference how it was done then versus how it is done now. Back then, we would have three main things. We would have the data, we would have the compute cl clusters, and we would have PhD researchers working in some kind of disconnect. I remember in 2011, I would receive sensor data, terabytes of recordings, from a seabed in the North Sea. And it, this would happen four times a year. I would create models on our cluster four times a year. And I would 
take the model and I would create an inference from this model or a result four times a year. And then I would, I would do it for every quarter and I would look at the difference and I would report some anomalies between two consecutive surveys. Nowadays, we can do it in milliseconds and we can have all this process completely automated. So th this slide we are looking at, it's actually relevant not only for Meta, but for many internet data companies. On the right side, we have business metrics. Business metrics can be just one, revenues, or it can be multiple. Time spent in seconds, how many time our users spend on our platform, how popular our platform is with our users. And these metrics often, we will have tens of them and they will have some units, physical units, such as dollar amount or seconds behind them. In the middle, we see an example of the interaction of our users with the platform. Every piece of content that we can see here is actually recommended by a model. And we hope, we hope that this there is a link, there is a relation between the quality of the models to this matrix. This relation is not linear. We are not going to, if we, if we have a high confidence of some ad or content for some particular user, we are not going to bombard this user start, starting from now with this ad. There is, there is some balance, but we, we know that high accuracy models, high accuracy of our models, will drive this mod, the, the, business, the, the business metrics. Now we have hundreds of models that power, that power this interaction. And on the left, we see the, I call it sandbox machine learning. This sandbox machine learning includes five popular components. It includes the data, the raw data, features, we create features manually, ad hoc, often from the data. Then we create model. Then we evaluate this model for the uh, for the out for the unseen evaluation data. Then we repeat this multiple times to try to increase the accuracy of the model for the unseen data. And then we deploy this model in production. We can deploy it once. We can we we, we can deploy it live at the Earth scale. Now, these five components, they will be true for any ML. If, someone's, if someone decides to play with this popular ML competition platform, Kaggle, the very first exercise, Titanic, which requires to predict survival, survival rate for the Titanic passengers, will also have these five components. So what we, we are, what we were able to success uh, to achieve over the past years is to power up this experience, moving from the sandbox to the production earth scale. So the way to power up this sandbox machine learning is to create dedicated machine learning infrastructure. In reality, we will have not one, but we will have thousands of models. And these models will work with thousands of features each. Total, the total amount of features will be in the millions. Each mo the, our models will, compute, will consume billions of training, training rows. And these models eventually will be served at the global scale with high availability. So the net, this slide shows us the infrastructure components that we developed to automate this, uh, this process. Our engineers, they're able to go from the insights about the training data and the labels to actually serving production model at the earth scale in days. It's actually a very unique 
capability. There are still many companies, internet companies, that work on the so-called throw over the wall things approach. When data scientists, when they're done with their work, they will hand over the insights to someone else and someone else will work on production to productionize them. We have a platform that is able to automate this whole experience. The author will see the actual results by, will be able to see the actual results of the model that they train by themselves. So we have multiple layers in this infrastructure. Maybe I will give an example of one of them. It's called predictor. And the predictor is helping us to power up the inferences. We have actually not one, but multiple predictors. And the main goal is to automate the process of once the model ways are finalized, there is something else, a, plat a platform that will serve this model at the global scale in real time. So now we see that we were able to move from the sandbox machine learning to earth scale real time experience using this unique machine learning infrastructure. This machine learning infrastructure helps us to deal with lots of data, lots of compute. Our models, they are large and they, they actually can consume not one, but multiple data centers and clusters. These models are served at global scale. The amount of the models and model architectures is, uh, is absolutely unconstrained. And it, we always evolve, we're working on evolving our infrastructure. It means at any time we will support multiple infrastructure units. Now, two things that we will not compromise on is the opportunity to serve our, to work at the global scale and to provide real-time experience. Now we have the app theorem that kicks in and tells us there is something that we will need to compromise on the data consistency. And this closes, that's how I see how this cap theorem actually closes the loop or feeds back the original sandbox machine learning. We started with something which was almost an offline file and we would create a model and we would, and we would iterate and we, would, we will work on improving this model. And then we will create an infrastructure that is able to scale this process for thousands of engineers, thousands of models and make it available at the global scale. But now we actually, but now the data itself starts to experience this cap theorem hiccups. We'll start seeing missing data. We'll start seeing data inconsistencies. We'll start seeing label leaking into our data. And this in terms influences the whole loop. That means now when we iterate on the model in the first place, we need to take into account the pro production platform hiccups. One solution of for dealing with this is monitoring. So at the monitoring time, we will observe, we will try, we will snapshot stats for the training data. We will persist the statistics. And then we will look at the statistics of the serving or production data. And we will try to make sure that there is minimal deviation between the two. And in case it happens, we will create something. We will work, we will, we will create some kind of follow-up workflows to deal with the deviation. But the data itself, as we can see in our, on this diagram, the data itself is not a static sandbox machine learning thing anymore. It's not a CSV file as all of the, Comp uh, competitions, Kaggle competitions actually 
or, or organized. It's something else. It's it's a data, and for every feature, we will have a kind of production distribution behind it. Production influence distribution behind it. So I I have explained to us the the role of the data for large scale internet can, uh, modern companies. I should explain, I want to say a few words about our compute power to train, to, to take full utilization, to fully utilize big data. We want to, exp to have opportunity to experiment with large model architectures. This mar large model architectures, they are powered up by large compute clusters. There are, of, there are hiccups in this process as well. Training process may, may fail. We need to learn to persist snapshot model training and to be able to continue it. We'll need to learn to distribute it over multiple nodes. Machine learning deployed for modern at Meta and for modern data companies. It's extremely heterogeneous. It utilizes almost everything, every known to in ML paradigm. Videos, images, we, they will all go through embeddings, embeddings, and these embeddings will be constantly updated and refined for different tasks. And the stack itself, it's constantly evolving. You don't have the luxury to create something and to hold it for years. We, the teams are constantly updating and improving the components of the machine learning infrastructure. That means that there is the challenge to be able to keep this infrastructure running over heterogeneous stack. And now I want to speak about the actual disconnect. I want to speak about things where we actually do need a lot, do need help. We, if thousands of engineers at Meta and at any internet data company will be involved in ad hoc manual work that is the moment is not does it does not have analytical recipes i'm going to dive deep into areas where having an any analytical guidance be it a theory or an open source package would be very helpful one example is as in the beginning i started with problems where we don't have experts and we don't have human consensus so one example of the problems is you have the targets, it can be ads or click predictions. You have the data and it is the amount of the data that we have about our users, it's almost infinite. We have videos, images, text data, and we have the friends and the, and the graph connections. Can, is there anyone to, any way, is there any way to tell that we, once we create the model using the data relevant up until now, this problem, this model will generalize for the future, for the next week, next day, or next one hour. Another example that is currently solved through manual ad hoc work of many engineers is moving from raw data to features. We create humanly meaningful features such as amount of interactions amount of or counts of different things of users with our platform we created from the original raw data events is there any way to automate this process in such a way that these features will be created most optimal in computer vision there was this this phase is actually solved successfully when we go from the raw image pixels and we train for the most accurate or for most relevant 
image computer vision filters. Now, our challenge is that we don't have pixels, we don't have images, we don't have experts that can tell, look at the data of all historical events of our users and, and tell which of this data can be relevant and what kind of features or filters at all may work or may not work. In computer vision, these features that are currently trained in the first place, they are created by experts analytically. Another, another example that is currently solved manual ad hoc by many engineers is relevance of data. We have problems, we have targets that we want to predict, we have data, and we are also looking, we are always looking for opportunity to use more and more fresh data. However, there is no analytical tool that could tell us the quality of the new data and how this new data can be helpful to improve our accuracies. In fact, for many problems, which are not AI, which don't have human bias uh, accuracies, we don't have this bounds at all. We don't have any analytical bounds, and the teams are working on improve and driving, trying to improve model predictions by percent and another percent. It's in that maybe another percent, and there is. It's almost at the moment we simply don't know if some particular problems we are working on. Maybe we exhausted already, or how far we are from the theoretical bound that some problem actually intrinsically limited to. <laughs> the next uh, range of problems that I want to tell uh, to talk today is production problems, label leaking. Label leaks happen when it's when we have information about future some, somehow leaked into the past. It happens, it can happen with any production system. It's possible to figure it out manually by, by looking at what actually happened. But in reality, what happens is that first we will see user engagement metrics drop. Then we will have production engineers assigned to RCA to look at the causes of these problems. And then the production engineers, our days of work will figure out that there was a label leak due to some cluster hiccup. And the follow-up on this process will be, we will blacklist periods of data as from training. Now this process, that I described, it's real thing. It's absolutely, that's how things work. And as you, you see, it's ad hoc manual process. Any type of analytical guidance or prediction on the label leaking, it's something that can be extremely helpful for in our work. Data inconsistency. It's something when it's easy to, to identify when edges become negative or when the names become not, not legit, but there are multidimensional data inconsistencies that, is, that still happen in the data. We uncover these problems by hand, and then we blacklist the training data from model training. Any help with analytical or open source a component that would indicate that the data, the training data, the sharing data has become inconsistent, will release hundreds of hours of manual work of our engineers. Another, maybe to conclude, if you, I'll give another, another example, it's we, very often we will have teams working on hard problems, trying to increase accuracies by a few percent, another few percent, adding more and more data. Having any 
analytical tool that would indicate how far or close we are from the analytical bound of the predictability of some problem. That's something that will enormously help in our work. So I hope with this review, I was able to first show us the successes that we, are able, that we, were, that we were able to build over years with moving from sandbox to production ML. And at the same time, I, was, I hope I was able to engage or at least to make you a little bit aware, more aware about kind of blind zones or dead zones that have been not addressed yet by analytical machine learning. I thank you for your attention and I'm be happy to move to the Q&A. Hey, Roman, uh, thanks so much for that great talk. Um, it, was, it was really interesting, kind of the, those problems that you talked about. Um, so I'm going to quickly stop your screen share so that um, everybody can kind of see your, uh, our faces during the public Q&A. Um, so now we're, we're actually just going to transition into the public Q&A with, with the YouTube live audience. So as a reminder, to if you're listening uh, over on YouTube, uh, you can post questions in the YouTube chat at any time, and we'll uh, summarize those and get those over to Roman. Um, so just to get started, um, I, I thought this, this talk was really interesting. It talks about a lot of kind of really important things. Um, one thing that was kind of in the back of my head during this whole thing was, uh, I'm kind of curious, you, you kind of talked about how you know, the modeling or uh, the, the way that we kind of train things and how often we train things has changed a lot um, over the past like 20 years or so. Um, what is kind of, uh, in your view, if you, if you take like maybe a bit of a longer view, what's kind of one of the more surprising things or one of the more surprising trends um, that you've noticed um, kind of as technology has evolved, as, as the, you know, things that, that we can do have changed? Yes, it's actually it's actually it's a it's a good it's a good multidimensional que uh, question. And one direction I, I can remind I I re I'm actually remember very vividly the the arguments when we had at uh, ten years ago about moving super expensive, super pro proprietary, super private data to clouds, and it when it was absolutely crystal clear to everyone. That is not, it was not going to happen. And it was back in 2013, 14, 15. I think now it will be hard. It will be very hard to find a single company that will not operate its most expensive proprietary data, not on the cloud. That's, that's one direction. On this real time availability, when you interact with the platform, and there is a very high probability that the, your, the interactions of your few past seconds will be aggregated and used in the next, in, in the predictions. It's something that lo looks astonishing compared to someone who was working in tr mod tr model training 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, those kind of that, that real time nature of these systems. I think that's something that, you know, people on the podcast have talked about before. I remember even way back, like Chip in like, I don't know, that must have been episode, the first time ep episodes was talking about how, you know, data is always changing and evolving. Um, I wonder if I, I also found it fascinating that there was, you know, a time where people were debating so partly about whether to move data onto clouds. I guess I can you can kind of imagine both sides of that argument where you want to have kind of very fine grained control um, over uh, kind of like very fine grained control over um like your computer infrastructure and stuff versus the the availability or the the convenience of having somebody else manage it for you were there was there anything when that debate was maybe actually happening in 2013 were there any kind of perspectives or you know ways about looking at things that kind of uh did you maybe notice any trends about how 
you know, maybe people who thought in cer- a certain way were, were more likely to see uh, to see where it was going. Um, you know, I'm just kind of curious if we can take any of those philosophies that were, you know, so relevant back then and, and see how, how they apply now. That's interesting. I, I, I remember from the 10 years ago that this, the privacy of the data or this ownership of the data is, was so important. And if I had, if I get tapes from satellites on, from some seabed sensors, into my room, the only way for me to push them to our data center would be to call an officer or an employee from the data center and almost to work with him to upload the, the tapes. And then at that time, someone who would tell me, you won't need to do it anymore. The data will be managed by someone else that, and you will never see these people at all. It, it, was, it, it kind of looked almost insane, irrelevant. And here we are, and, and we are actually living this reality right now. Maybe the next, another surreal thing that may happen, I, I hope will happen in the next maybe years, maybe five years, is this moving from absolutely experiment-driven thing to something analytical. With any empirical approach, you always have this risk that someone says, hey, I tried to add big positive number to this negative number. Then the result came out still negative. Let's not try to do it anymore. Adding positive numbers is not going to change the sign of the number of the negative number. There's always risk of this thing of this theology in any empirical experiment. So that means that empirical experimentation at any scale by itself still needs analytical support and having this analytical support the un, un, unlocking the experimentation right now exp, experimentation is a solo player you run you you, exp, you create more ex, uh, complex model architectures you have more parameters you add hyperparameter tuning now you need to iterate over more big in, in, amount of models you add more infrastructure and now, now you have more models and this model, so there's a high probability that model training will fail. Now you need to learn how to snapshot model training and to prevent, prevent it from falling. And kind of this snowball, it's, it's something that will benefit tremendously from analytical guidance, analytical solutions, analytical intuition. And there, I, I hope that the next breakthrough will come from this analytical support where we need to actually to move next, where our experimentation we want to do. And just to help us to minimize this adding positive negative numbers and making this can, uh, too fast conclusions. Roman, one thing that I, you know, that uh, stuck me in, the, in, in your presentation is, you know, the, the very last part when you were talking about things like you know, debugging and the different consistencies and things like that. I'm curious if there's like, um, uh, so you pose them as potentially still open questions, right? Uh, but at the same time, I imagine that you're probably are doing something um, to prevent that, uh, to, to basically um, building some some tooling or anything to, to actually um, help you out, right? And so I'm curious if there's anything that you could potentially share with, with us, with the audience, um, any lessons learned on that? Like, what is the process that you are following for like this kind of debugging and how people can do it on their own when they try to deploy models? After yes, the, the, the current, yes, of course, I'll be happy to do it. And of course, the any machine learning infrastructure and any team that deploys live models will have some kind of monitoring, at least for the some postulates or some things that they they are they know must be must hold in order for the model to work correctly but this lack of analytical component analytical something analytical monitoring that can monitor this the live data and tell us you start to have your data starts to experience label leaking i'm not aware about analytical solution there are ad hoc manual things and of course, when the engineers, they, they're done with the investigation, they will create some kind of wrap up, some kind of monitoring regression tool that will try to prevent this thing in the future. 
but having analytical solution that can flag that can work maybe not for the whole world of data but for some problems maybe not for the whole scenarios but maybe for some scenarios it would be extremely helpful there is a huge amount of still ad hoc manual work involved in this production engineering part we all we, we have titles we have engineers with titles and the title is production engineer and that's exactly what j their job is yeah i know that that's again um, I, I agree that you know a more um, analytical approach could go beyond the let's say ad hoc things that we're doing right now but i'm also curious like for because you know these ad hoc things are also coming from experience and best practices right so um, I'm curious if there's anything specific that you would suggest someone that is deploying um, a system in production that um, to like debug data inconsistencies after after deployment and discovering them that you, you do like on a daily basis that other people can also learn to do. So okay, so Meta doesn't doesn't uh, does not open did not open its uh, cloud, but Google did. So if you if you look at uh, google cloud platform the uh, you will see we will see components data validation components that will work together with a will uh, actually will work on top of production models now if you dive deep into this uh, data validation components we will see that actually they are either rule based such as fire an alert when the age of someone is greater than 1000 years or there are anomaly detection things which will in, in either in one dimension or multiple dimension will 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 tell you that there is a, the current data looks too different from what it was or what it should be. But the data, but there is still a wide range of problems such as data leakage. I'm simply not aware of any solution that could tell you ahead of time that the data is actually there is data leak happening. And the big the biggest problem with data leak is that immediately you will see the results with the actual business metrics so any alert about this will immediately will be will first have immediate business impact and second will save a lot a lot of human time a lot of time to unblock to debug to root cause the these problems the reason why i brought this problem today for the seminar is because i'm not aware about data leak and monitoring mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Roman, uh, I want to chat about one of the questions you posed on trying to find optimal features for something like a recommendation task. Um, and I was trying to think about, you know, what makes that problem hard? And it seems like for, for any one person, there might be a different set of like optimal relevant features that will help some model determine, you know, what adds to service for example. And then the rest of the features are actually just noise. Um, but that set might be uh, unique. We're well, not unique, but, but uh, different for every one of us. And so we're trying to essentially have one model that's big enough to take in all these features and, and make good predictions, recommendations for everyone. But it won't be optimal, right? It'll be good enough, but maybe not optimal. So is optimality something that is even possible to achieve with the current approach of having a gigantic model for for all users okay i think further what you i almost hear between the lines there is this so-called model bias thing when you have groups of users that once you work with one single big model which operates of course with statistics it's a statistical <laughs> average that this small groups of model will almost certainly will be missed while, while, while the model main focus is to drive the overall prediction accuracies up. So that's, that's another question. We can create either multi-head models or maybe multiple models or cluster or some kind of clustering, pre-cluster analysis. But if, if you go back to this manual ad hoc feature creation, it, it is actually that happens right now. We, we have engineers that create these features by hand. And of course, they create physically meaningful features. There is no way I, I can come up with something that has no physical meaning, like some kind of 10 dimensional manifold over some, some kind of, of events. 
automating, but it starts with the same raw data for many models. So the question is, if we can create some, we can automate, the, first we can automate this process of, of creating smart features from the data, and then take it maybe to different directions, create small subgroups, unbiased models, multi-head models. It could be something that would utilize this very first block, utilizing the data in the, in the best way. And it relates to computer vision, where the, this, the filters, computer vision filters in pre-ML era were analytically derived through edge detection and Gaussian formulas. But now they are routinely trained through these models. But in, in computer vision, you look at the pictures, you look at the image, you, can, you, you have some kind of intuition. In recommendation, ranking, ads, content recommendation problems, your data is, uh, is not pixels. It says it's a high dimensional thing, which is impossible to evaluate with just human eye. Right. And I just think it's going to be hard to evaluate some set of features as optimal, where when we end up using them in this sort of also, I, I don't want to say ad hoc because it's so standardized at this point, but you know, stuff like stochastic gradient descent, where it might take those features and do something that's like, you know, we can kind of analyze it statistically and, and, and assume that it'll converge to something good. But that's a, that's a hard analysis to run and it's very complex. Um, I, I had another question for you about, uh, I think you posed a question about uh, tasks like recommendation, right? Which are hard, which have no answer really, right? It, it's kind of hard to give a label to something. But when we train a new regression model, right? And we want to know if it's better than the old one we had. So we got some more data in production. We have uh, potentially a better model we want to deploy. Right now, I assume that, you know, you guys would do something like regression testing, where we look at all the successful kind of ads that were served and then clicked on and make sure the new model would also serve those ads. And in some sense, you get, um, you get, an idea of whether your new model is at least as good as the old one. Um, are there tools like that? And, and would you say that that's like an analytical tool because it does give you a sort of guarantee on improvement or monotonicity? Yes. Yes. First of all, it's a, I think we have not tens but hundreds of engineers focusing on exactly this work. If there is a recipe, someone comes up, comes comes up with a recipe to increase the accuracy. You have a range of tools and engineers whose job will be to validate, not only on online, but even for at the offline stage that you, the model or the new recipe or new idea is at least as good as it was as the, you have the current one. But if you look at this process, it's empirical experiment driven thing. You collect data, you store the data or predictions or accuracies. Then for the same data, you run the new thing and you compare the results. And uh, there is a, absolutely no an analysis formulas or something that can almost, like I'm, I'm thinking maybe some kind of, maybe like bounds that we have, like N log N that we have for fast Fourier transform or some kind of asymptotical bounds that we can maybe expect from this tool that could tell us that you are that close to the maximum possible accuracy for this problem. Sure, I mean, uh, yeah, it's hard to find a maximum, but I think knowing that you're going in the right direction is not quite as good, but uh, <laughs> I guess in the right direction. Yes, and th but then brings us to another problem that you have, a Group of people, they work hard together. They keep improving, improving, improving. Where is uh, the guarantee that we are not, as a group of people, moving towards a very nice local optimum? Maybe the right ways to do is to step back, to forget everything that was done, and to start investigating absolutely different architectures and features. And maybe eventually we will lose some accuracy, maybe first months, but maybe we will eventually end up with something else. But it's... Again, we don't have any analytical thing that would help us to, that would actually tell us, indicate 
if we are in some local minimum or there is something else that we, we should explore that absolutely super different for what we were doing up, up until now. Mm -hmm. I think my, my takeaway from this conversation is we probably need a few more theorists on this show. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I totally get what you're saying, Roman, where, um, you know, uh, there, I think there, there is actually quite a bit of work in machine learning that is informed by theory or that tries to use theory to explain particular phenomena, um, you know, over the, I think not, not maybe in the past couple of weeks, but, you know, certainly um, in, in talks past, we've had discussions about, uh, you, you know, I, I, I talked about, you know, some, some theory about what representations models learn and, and what we can use to, um, to learn from that. Um, so I think, uh, I, I'm not too familiar with, you know, regression or, or theory around regression, but, um, I think, you know, this is something that, that people care, um, care a lot about. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting, Fyodor, that I, I do think I also empathize with Fyodor because, you know, there are, there are definitely people who say as long as SGD works, <laughs> I, I don't care why. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a whole fourth floor of gates. Um, actually, I, I don't actually know where they sit anymore. I think the theorists used to sit on the fourth floor um, who, who, who spend a lot of time, you know, trying to reason about why deep learning works um, and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, it's always evolving. I think, you know, recently robustness has been very important. I think a couple weeks ago we had, uh, I think our, our, Arjun Okula was talking about that. Um, and there are different ways to, to evaluate these things. Um, so, so it's definitely interesting how, uh, you know, the ways that we think about these things kind of evolves over time. Um, uh, yeah, Roman, I, I'm kind of curious, you know, with that context, like what are the things that you wish you knew or you wish you were able to, you know, find out that um, that we might not be able to? So I think Fyodor was bringing you up that maybe not everybody has the same goal that they want to get to. So you have to be sensitive about your objectives. Um, Roman, what are, when you actually deploy these systems and, and actually run them, what are some questions that you have that maybe you have some trouble answering um, or uh, what, what does that kind of look like for you? Um, because, you know, if there are theorists in the audience, maybe, maybe they have um, some opinions or some uh, thoughts about how we could reason about them in a analytical or a uh, more principled manner. Yeah, maybe I, I had some experience years ago where I, I think as many others tried to, uh, to try my strengths in stock returns predictions or doing something with creating optimal portfolios. And I failed miserably. I, and I remember it doesn't matter how many layers I would add to more data, more hyperparameters units, more embeddings, more evaluation, multi-year of stress testing. It's somehow this, the moment that you create the model with the data that is fresh right now, when what comes out next, let's say for the next days, I'm not speaking about the frequency training, but the trading, but the like multi hour, multi year predictions, it somehow looks like this model is there's absolutely no way to indicate to tell how well what you have in your hand can generalize for the next one hour, two hours, or five hours except empirical, just put it on uh, some training mode and, and see what comes out from this model. So this, if I think if I had this opportunity to look at this problem again, I would start in the first place with you, you creating some kind of data quality indicator. That's eventually that what I, we ended up developing. We created data quality index that would say, that based on the data that you have, if it's total noise or if it's like that much different from the absolute, from just a random data to predict your task. And then we were able to see, I remember we were able to see that some of the trading strategies were a little bit more successful than, uh, than others. So starting with this data quality index thing, something that can tell you at all if your data Will, will your data generalize for the future or not? That is something that I 
I would personally, I would more, I would, I would expect more effort, more help, and it's something that should be absolutely very first step with any new uh, uh, my, uh, my, uh, modeling pro, uh, modeling problem. Data quality index. How think, think, your yeah. data is not an ups, is not just a random noise. Yeah, I, I know there's a there's a healthy literature on generalization theory that tries to tackle this problem from a more abstract or asymptotic point of view. Um, I think recently I've been hearing about a series or uh, a, a subfield called conformal prediction, where I think it's it's still in classification right now, but I think usually you can generalize from classification to regression um, with with some standard tricks. Um, but in conformal prediction, the they not only try to predict you know, what the right answer is, but also error bars or, or error estimates of how confident you are in that answer. Um, and, you know, maybe if there's somebody, you know, who does conformal um, prediction in, in the audience, um, that they, they can tell us a bit more about it. But, um, you know, that that's the first thing that, that comes to mind. Um, for me, I'm not sure how well it works yet, but there, there are certainly people um, who are thinking about it. Uh, yeah. Piero, I think you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, we're we approaching the end, but if you can squeeze another question in that I'm curious about. Um, um, Roman, uh, you touched upon the, the let's say, issues that are coming from the fact that, you know, you cannot get um, human labels um, for things like recommendation, right? And basically the labels that you get are effects of previous behaviors from users. And and, and, um, I, it, and you, you mentioned it as a, as, a, as a problem, and I understand that. Uh, I think it's also... You know, it, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's also a blessing because that allows you to collect much more data than you would otherwise, right? Because if a, a person would have to tag every single instance in that case, um, it would be extremely expensive and probably will not be feasible at all, right? So I'm curious in balance between the um, aspect of having the possibility to collect more data, but data that is collected through an automated process or, and that could also be very biased because again, you're showing the user a set of elements and they're choosing from the set of elements where there's potentially millions of other elements that are not being shown at all. So the user may have never have selected them. So in curious in balance, what is your experience uh, there? And it is something that we can we can learn from how to deal with these kind of problems on real systems in, in, in production. Okay. So if I step back and I focus at the problems where this human or manual labeling does not exist, does not even exist, uh, there are some kind of stereotypes that are both popular and utilized and kind of they, they help. One of them is more data helps. Well, you don't have the, the actual labels, you don't have theoretical bounds, but you can get, now you can learn, you could look at the videos that uh, were uploaded by the user and then you can apply embedding to the videos and maybe these embeddings can be trained on something else and utilize this, the, the quality of the videos uploaded in the past one hour to come up with user intentions, user, user click capability. So that, that's kind of, that's the direction where we are. That's a direction that is, that is popular. It is driven, by, it's limited by compute, but more compute will unblock more and more opportunities to utilize to utilize using more different data, more fresh data, but it, it's still, the loop is still not closed. We don't have the, the we don't have the, the ground truth labels. We don't have the actual, any theoretical bounds about how well we can predict something. I, I almost think about this example. We know how to train uh, links and joints robots to work in physical environment but think about if the laws of physics they change every five minutes or maybe change every one minute will we able to learn to work joints and links a robot when the laws of physics they are changing maybe they don't even exist so that's so if i if, if i if i step back where we are at so we we will create a model we know that the, the moment that we deploy this model this model will influence the actual market the, mo the moment that we start serving the ad we change the perception we change the things 
what should be the wh where we are at what should be the actual theoretical expectation from the model quality prediction should it be 80 percent precision or recall 90 or 55 53 Yeah, so that, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think we are actually out of time. Um, so we're, we're right at that 2.30 mark. So um, I, I think we'll, we'll call it at that. Um, but thank you, Roman, so much for, for coming and talking to us today. It was, it was a great talk, great and lively conversation afterwards. Um, thanks, everyone on YouTube for, for tuning in and watching. Um, uh, as always, you can go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu to check out our schedule, go sign up for our mailing list. Um, I think we only send you like one or two emails a week. Um, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel to get, uh, to get, and hit that little bell icon to get notified when we go live and when we post new videos. Um, uh, we're nearing 10,000 subscribers. So hopefully we'll, we'll reach there by the end of the summer, uh, with, uh, with some help from, from you, the YouTube audience. Um, so next week we have, uh, Hima Lakaraju from, uh, Harvard talking to us. Um, so that, that's sure to be a great talk. Uh, that's also going to mark the end of our, uh, spring quarter. Um, we're not going to have regular talks during the summer, but you know, as we've hinted a few times, we may, uh, we may drop in for an iron chef contest, uh, now and then. Um, Piero, did you see they're they're opening in Italy in San Jose? Um, so we're we're going to be able to get all the ingredients that we need for our contest. That's very good. I think they've been hinting at opening it for a while. If it's happening right now, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, with that, we'll we'll wave goodbye to YouTube and thank you again, Roman, so much for uh, for coming.